Thank you for the introduction and thanks to the committee for organizing this so smoothly. I'm very happy and grateful to be presenting here today. So the issue of contextualizing col coloniality, particularly strikes me recently because of the different attitudes towards the late Queen Elizabeth. While we've seen many colon colonies still haunted by their traumatic past, many in Hong Kong are actually paying tributes to the monarch of a colonial regime. So how come in a period of post-colonialism, so many people are rejecting the new yet original Chinese authority while actively recalling the past rules? And how did these attitudes towards the two governments form? So today I'd like to go beyond textbook history and to compare the ways in which the British col colonial government and the Hong Kong SAR government have responded to the 1967 riots and the 2019 protests through heritage management, respectively. As such, we'll be able to see how and why heritage is constructed, valorized, mobilized, or even erased. Then by linking these two incidents together, I wish to evaluate how government narratives have changed or sustained through time. And by identifying memory and effects as apparatuses of power, ultimately we can see how memory affects or emotions and essentially culture could be conflicted and negotiated. We've had many past discussions about memory just now, um, but today I'm focusing on social memory, particularly um, as, a, as a sort of product and apparatus of the government's um, overall overarching narrative. Whereas to define effects, um, uh, it refers to how the state elicited powerful emotions such as hope, fear, desire, or hatred, um, as political agency. Um, and I incorporated uh, effects as into memory as a sensory experience to better understand how the whole situation has played out in the post in both periods. And moving on, I have singled out the aftermaths of the riots or the protests as the angle of di dissection today because during these periods, the governments were the most reactive and the civilians would urge, would urge for stability. In such cases, heritage management would in inevitably be fueled by a political agenda, making the role of cultural heritage in society more prominent. The two incidents that appeal to me because they're said to be the turning points in Hong Kong history. The 1967 riots took place under the rule of the colonial government as the labor protests quickly escalated into a leftist riots as an anti-British struggle. The riots then prompted the non-interventionist British government to introduce sweeping social reforms in labor rights, education, public housing, and social welfare. However, the violence of the leftist riots, the leftists, including placing the bombs in public places and even assassinating a leftist critic, has alienated themselves from the public and bred the earliest concept of a Hong Kong consciousness and identity in the society which comprised largely of immigrants. Well, on the other hand, I think many of you might be familiar with this already. The 2019 anti-extradition law amendment bill movement or the 2019 protests had led to direct intervention of the Chinese government through the introduction of the new national security law that virtually banned all forms of demonstrations and dissolved most pro-democracy groups within two years. As such, I've characterized and differentiated the government's heritage management strategies by two main themes, heritage construction and conservation, as well as destruction. And I realized that the, the division between these two categories actually show how heritage is classified into the desirable and the dangerous. And this kind of narrative fundamentally distinguished the sort of institutionalized heritage, such as museum exhibitions, um, from the protest heritage, such as political graffiti and posters. Well, in terms of construction and conservation, both governments have made use of the exhibitions to narrate a Hong Kong, a so-called Hong Kong story. Um, the Hong Kong Week in November 1967 was arguably a catalyst for the formation of a new Hong Kong identity. This seven-day festival aimed to promote colony products for exports and consisted of arts and historical exhibitions, fashion shows, and even a pageant event in which a lot were actually claimed to be part of the ancient Chinese culture. 
The art this articulation and entrepreneurial appeal to Hong Kong has then effectively forged a cultural identity by linking a lot of these um, entrepreneurial um, financial products to the past, which questionably could be um, fictional. And at the same time, the city hall, which had previously been dominated by Chinese art and antiquities, also started curating Hong Kong themed exhibitions after the riot, echoing the state effort to promote a Hong Kong identity. Well, fast forward to 50, about 50 years later, the government just launched a new cultural policy under the guidance of China's new five year plan, which calls for a facilitation of the youth's quote, aspiration and willingness to strive for the future of our country, end quote. It's not, it's not hard to spot the narrative of a national identity since before the 2019 process, but there was definitely an acceleration of such narrative on national identity after the process. And the direction and the direct intervention from the central government with this supervising five-year plan was indeed unprecedented. The intended narrative is perhaps more prominent in the recently reopened Hong Kong Museum of Art, um, local art historian Venice Cheng has criticized that the museum actually failed to showcase the actual social political struggles of the people, which constitutes the true Hong Kong spirit. She found that the exhibition ended up only reiterating the cliched and colonial rhetoric, which depicts Hong Kong as, an, as nothing but just a small fishing village before the arrival of the colonizers. For example, under this painting of um, the Aberdeen port, the wall text actually described described it as the Oriental London and River Thames in the East, which only emphasized the archaic position of Hong Kong as a Western colony on Chinese soil without any concept of a local identity. Um, so both in both cases, they're taking very different narratives. The two governments actually similarly forged the Hong Kong identities by mobilizing heritage. More importantly, it seems that both governments have constructed or invented a kind of heritage based on um, depiction of the past um, with questionable authenticity. This shows how heritage is thoroughly politicized and reflecting the fluid, fluid nature of heritage, especially under government management. And on the opposite side of the spectrum, the process heritage was destroyed as part of the counterinsurgency policy which was often accompanied by the use of effectives in antagonizing the protesters and could result in loss of memory. Destruction of heritage after the 1967 riots are now quite hard to trace because of the lack of awareness of heritage back then. Fortunately, historic sources provided evidence of censoring after the protests. The government cleaned up the political graffiti and imposed an emergency regulation against all leftist propaganda during the riots. Um, and this particular image here shows a screenshot of an archive video um, in which the police was actually painting over the protest slogan, down with the British imperialism, outside, just outside the central market. So it is lucky that I could find evidence of heritage destruction in terms of treatment of the propaganda. Um, however, there are probably many destroyed heritage that were not kept in memory or records. It would also be expected that many demo demolitions of tr traditional buildings and cultural heritage would not be properly recorded, and many were probably justified as urban renewal plans. Well, con well, traces of 2019 protests in the landscape were um, differently extensive. As the streets were turned into combat zones and shop fronts were turned into billboards for propaganda. Um, however, the political graffiti and posters were also were also um, cleared when the national security law came into force in July 2020. And apart from the protest symbols embedded in the daily landscape, there was also censorship in public institutions through the removal or replacement of sensitive objects, including the removal of the pillar of shame in the unit from the University of Hong Kong, um, which memorializes the loss of life in the Tiananmen massacre on June 4th um, in 1989. In such cases, the heritage was not destroyed by the government per se, but was rather eradicated from the heritage landscape. Censorship in public institution, which houses thousands of students at the protest front line, did not only act as a warning, 
but also marked the end of the last bits of freedom that fundamentally differentiated Hong Kong from the rest of mainland, essentially also an eradication of the Hong Kong identity. Now, as we reach the final discussion, what have we learned from the comparison between the two eras? How does the past inform the present or the future? A, continu a continuity from the past to the present can be seen through the utilization of social memory and effects of power. Um, uh, the continuity in social memory can be spotted in official historic writing um, because there is an ongoing simplification of local history and identities in both colonial and post-colonial eras, such as the case that we saw in uh, the Hong Kong Museum of Arts. However, a more obvious example could be the naming of the movement itself. Specific, sorry, specifically remembering of the series of the 1967 movements as riots. Many witnesses or participants in memoirs of the riots actually claim that it was an anti-British struggle. And I also must admit that in my preliminary understanding of the riot also came from mass media, which focused largely on the violence. And the repeated emphasis on rioting was casted in many Hong Kong citizens' minds, including mine. In particular, the post-colonial government might have exploited the public's pho phobia of rioting as well. This really shows an effective use of social memory to generate both a sense of belonging and resentment towards any sorts of political movement. So far, I have posited heritage, memory, and effect as apparatuses and constituents of power under this grand government narrative. While serving limited attention to human agency and resistance of the public, in this complex of social relations and power networks where protests where protests or riots take place, um, a counter narrative explores how realities are circulated, challenged, and historicized. In the immediate aftermath of the riots and protests, we saw the heights of encounter between government persuasive narrative and public resistance in the heritage sector, which are often fed by personalized memories and affections. For example, regarding the cleaning up of the posters of the British colonial government, the editor of the leftist newspaper back then, um, of Dai Gongbo, asserted that the more they are cleared, the more there will be. Posting these posters for propaganda was actually a way of resisting the government for the leftists. Although most of these traces are now nowhere to be seen in the city landscape, some of these materials are kept online. While I was doing my research, I find I found sites and posts um, dedicated to the memory of the 1967 riots and that were not available to the public in government archives. Protesters have also tried to keep their memories authentic after the 2019 protests, if not through books, which are largely censored now, and oral history. Social media has definitely played a huge role in retaining and spreading social memories of the protests that the government has less control over. This may be an alternative to um, alternative to physical commemorations, as more people prefer to be anonymous for safety reasons. More products are created online as a way of social memory, including videos, blogs, and posts. The motto of the moment, "Be Water," signify that the protesters' actions should be adaptable, tactical, fast, and spontaneous. The way water, just like the way water flows um, through cracks in a structure. Some restaurants and shops in Hong Kong now have established walls of blank sticky notes to continue the protest, imitating the neighborhood Lenin Wall back then. The loss of protest heritage gave as sorry, the protest heritage as a medium for experiencing political feelings does not mean the movement's effective intensities have dissipated, for they continue to circulate occasionally manifesting during an event as a show of the power of the people and their determination. Perhaps memories of the 1967 riots are retained partly, but the affections of the leftists are worse, that were so strongly felt during their demonstrations are now lost. So to keep such strong affections and memory in the resisting state would require huge collective efforts to sustain with the passage of time. Nevertheless, I have illustrated about the consciousness against the government's impositions and the derailment of government narratives in the face of public anger and resistance. Then as we, um, sorry, uh, and the derailment of government narratives in the face of public anger and resistance, which was exactly why the demonstrations broke out in the first place. 
Culture and society then, as we by social memory, exist in a constant flux and are continually conflicted and negotiated. Um, I started off by offering a comparison between the heritage management strategies and two between two eras. And I've established a division between um, the institutionalized heritage and protest heritage, which reflects how heritage could be similarly failurized, mobilized, or destroyed. Yet the two differ in the narratives of identity. If the 1967 riots had led to the creation of a new Hong Kong identity, the post 2019 protests would mean its eradication. Um, and so far, I have adopted a top-down approach when, where I see the government as an over, overarching, almost omnipotent power. So it is important to understand that the government is not the only play, um, power player here. The reality of troops are formulated in a complex power knowledge relation, as suggested by Co. Um, where other authorities, power, and individuals may have agency over collective memory and present and present attitudes towards the legacy, be it conformity or resistance. That is why I have incorporated memory and effects uh, to evaluate the politic, the potential consciousness of the people against state impositions. Um, finally, to answer my initial um, prompts. How have Hong Kong people developed such different attitudes towards their colonizers in comparison to other colonies? Perhaps it should be a better question left for the historian and po politicians. However, through my dis discussion, we could see how, um, through the perspective of heritage, um, the particular colonial identities could be established um, and continue to sustain throughout um, over time. And this shows how colonialism is still very much present now and its legacy continues to sustain in our lives and especially in the hong kong context um setting the foundation of the modern politics thank you